Yay! Seven days in a row, folks. We did it. We're here. We made it. And before we really begin, I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to all 15 of you for being my first 15 subscribers. It's very exciting, especially because none of us were here a week ago. Um, so that thanks for being here. It's fantastic. Um, I'm excited to be sharing these works with you, these words with you. They're very important. Um, and so let's just get started with the next chapter. If this is your first time joining us, we are reading Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Um, it is a very significant book. It's a memoir um, that Glennon Doyle released in 2020. Um, and you can just jump right in with us. We are just ending part two right now which is four keys. She doesn't specify which, but I say four keys for saving yourself. Um, and we are on page 73. You wanted to join us. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here. And I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be doing this. I'm feeling great. Okay, so I'm gonna start with let it burn. Key four, build and burn. When we let ourselves feel, our inner selves transform. When we act upon our knowing and imagination, our outer worlds transform. Living from the worlds within us will change our outer worlds. Here's the rub. Destruction is essential to construction. If we want to build the new, we must be willing to let the old burn. We must be committed to holding on to nothing but the truth. Truth. We must decide that if the truth inside us can burn a belief, a family structure, a business, a religion, an industry, it should have become ashes yesterday. If we feel, know, and imagine our lives, families, and world become truer versions of themselves, eventually. But at first, it's very scary. Because once we feel, know, and dare to imagine more for ourselves, we cannot unfeel, unknown, unknow, or unimagine. There is no going back. We are launched into the abyss, the space between not true, the not true enough life we're living and the truer one that exists only inside us. So we say, maybe it's safer just to stay here. Even if it's not true enough, maybe it's good enough. But good enough is what makes people drink too much and snark too much and become bitter and sick and live in quiet desperation until they lie on their deathbed and wonder, what kind of life, relationship, family, world might I have created if I had been braver? The building of the true and beautiful means the destruction of the good enough. Rebirth means death. Once a truer, more beautiful version is born inside us, life is in the direction of that vision. Holding on to what is no longer true enough is not safe. It's the riskiest move because it is the certain death of everything that was meant to be. We are alive only to the degree to which we are willing to be annihilated. Our next life will always cost us this one. Our next life will always cost us this one. I had that one underlined. If we are truly alive, we are constantly losing who we are, what we just built, what we just believe, what we just knew to be true. I have lost identities, beliefs, and relationships it has hurt to lose. I have learned that when I live from my emotions, knowing and imagination, I am always losing. What I lose is always what is no longer true enough, so that I can take full hold of what is. For a long while, I contorted myself to live according to a set of old memos I'd been issued about how to become a successful woman and build a strong family, career, and faith. I thought those memos were universal truth, so I abandoned myself to honor them without even unearthing and examining them. When I finally pulled them out of my subconscious and looked hard at them, I learned that these memos have never been truth at all, just my particular culture's arbitrary exp expressions. Oh, expectations. Hustling to comply with my memos, I was flying on autopilot, routed to a destination I never chose. So I took back the wheel. I quit abandoning myself to honor those memos. Instead, I abandoned the memos and began honoring myself. I began to live as a woman who never got the world's memos. <laughs> I underlined that and boxed that many times. Since then, I have had an awful time 
returning texts, messages, phone calls, direct messages, any type, any type of communication. I've basically not returned it in two years. I burned the memo that defined selflessness as the pinnacle of womanhood, but first I forgave myself for believing that lie for so long. I had abandoned myself out of love. They convinced me that the best way for a woman to love her partner, family, and community was to lose herself in service to them. In my desire to be of service, I did myself and the world a great disservice. I've seen what happens out in the world and outside our relationships when women stay numb, obedient, quiet, and small. Selfless women make for an efficient society, but not a beautiful, true, or just one. When women lose themselves, the world loses its way. We do not need more selfless women. What we need right now is more women who have detoxed themselves so completely from the world's expectations that they are full of nothing but themselves. What we need are women who are full of themselves. A woman who is so full of herself knows and trusts herself enough to say and do what must be done. She lets the rest burn. I burned the memo presenting responsible motherhood as martyrdom. I decided that the call of motherhood is to become a model, not a martyr. I unbecame a mother, slowly dying in her children's name, and became a responsible mother, one who shows her children how to be fully alive. I burned the memo insisting that the way a family avoids brokenness is to keep its structure by any means necessary. I noticed families clinging to the original structures that were very broken indeed. I noticed other families whose structures had shifted and were healthy and vibrant. I decided that a family's wholeness or brokenness has little to do with its structure. A broken family is a family in which any member must break herself into pieces to fit in. A whole family is one in which each member can bring her full self to the table, knowing that she will always be both held and free. I decided to let my family's form become an evolving ecosystem. I unbecame a woman clinging to a prescribed family structure and became one clinging to each of her family members right to their full humanity, including me. We would break and re-break our structure instead of allowing any of us to live broken. I quit buying the idea that a successful marriage is one that lasts till death, even if one or both spouses are dying inside it. I decided... I first read this book after I ended my only significant relationship we had been together for four years, um, and for a while, quite a while, I had the feeling that I was dying inside of this relationship, or that this relationship would be the death of me and we would not last till death. Um, and that was something that was very hard to communicate with my partner, and something that I don't think my partner really understood But reading this right after I left that relationship was so confirming for me and everything that I had just gone through. Um, And now reading it two years later, like because I read it so many times in 2020, it like (laughs) held me together. Um, And seeing all my notes and everything and like just remembering how broken and scared I felt. Like I, I did it. I made it out. And Glennon did it. And Glennon made it out. And, you know, we're all fighting to become truer versions of ourselves. I decided that before I ever vowed myself to another person, I'd take this vow to myself. I'll not abandon myself. Not ever again. Me and myself, we are till death do us part. We'll forsake all others to remain whole. I unbecame a woman who believed that another would complete me, when I decided that I was born complete. I let burn my cherished, comfortable idea of America as a place of liberty and justice for all. I let a truer, wider perspective be born in its place, one that included the American experience of people who don't look like me. 
I wrote myself a new memo about what it means to have strong faith. To me, faith is not a public alliance. Allegiance, thank you. Faith is not a public allegiance to a set of outer beliefs, but a private surrender to the inner knowing. I stopped believing in the middlemen or the hierarchy between me and God. I went from certain and defensive to curious and wide eyed and odd, from closed fists to open arms, from the shallow to the deep end. For me, Living in faith means allowing to burn all that separates me from the knowing so that one day I can say, I and the mother are one. (sighs) The memos I've written for myself are neither right nor wrong. They are just mine. They're written in sand so that I can revise them whenever I feel, know, imagine a truer, more beautiful idea for myself. I'll be revising them until I take my last breath. I am a human being meant to be in perpetual becoming. If I am living bravely, my entire life will become a million deaths and rebirths. My goal is not to remain the same but to live in such a way that each day, year, moment, relationship, conversation, and crisis is the material I use to become a truer, more beautiful version of myself. The goal is to surrender constantly who I just was in order to become who this next moment calls me to be. I will, no, I will not hold on to a single existing idea, opinion, identity, story, or relationship that keeps me from emerging new. I cannot hold too tightly to any riverbank. I must, I must let go of the shore in order to travel deeper and see farther, again and again and then again, until the final death and rebirth, right up until then. Hmm. Now, if you'll allow me just a moment, this chapter, this whole this whole part, part two, with all the different keys, was so poignant to me, at least. Um, each each one was just very very significant. This one, I felt like it brought up, at least for me, the "Let It Burn," burning your darlings. Um, it, I don't know, is. I know no one came here for like a philosophical recap of 2020, but it really felt like the world was burning and, and seeing it now still somehow still alive and we're all still somehow still alive. Well, you know, we've lost a lot of people. Um, but it's interesting for me to, to know what I was experiencing then and kind of what I'm experiencing right now and how similar they are. Um, like I was just fighting to to die to my old self then in terms of relationship and work um and (laughs) and it's a nice reminder to remind her to be free and oh wow look at that part three free to be free and to be yourself and to like not break yourself to fit into a broken system but to remain whole and the power of remaining whole and presenting yourself whole um I don't know. There's just Glennon Doyle is is an emotional social genius in my eyes. Um, okay, I want to continue into part three um, because we can, and we're just gonna go. We're gonna go in with aches. I'm 13 years old and bulimic, so I spend half my life curling my bangs and the other half eating excessively and throwing up. Curling and hurling are not an acceptable life. So on Fridays after school, my mom drives me downtown to the therapist. She stays in the lobby and I walk in alone, sit down in a brown leather chair, and wait for the therapist to ask, How are you today, Glennon? I'll smile and say, I'm fine. How are you today? She breathes deeply with her whole body, then we're quiet. I notice a picture of a small, red-headed girl on my kind, frustrated therapist's desk's desk. I ask who the girl is. She glances over, touches the frame, and says, That's my daughter. When she turns back to me, her face is sad and soft. She says, Glennon, you say you're fine, but you aren't. Your eating disorder could kill you. You know that. What you don't know is that since you refuse to feel all of this, since you won't join us in the land of the living, you're half dead already. I am offended. 
My insides turn hot and they feel instantly inflated, difficult to contain. I hold my breath and clench everything. Well, maybe I'm trying to be fine. Maybe all I do is try to be fine. Maybe I try harder than anybody. She says, maybe you should stop trying to be fine. Maybe life isn't fine. Maybe it'll never be fine. Maybe fine isn't the right goal. What if you stopped trying so hard to be fine and just lived? I don't know what you're talking about, I say. I know exactly what she's talking about. She's talking about the ache. I don't know when I first discovered the ache, but by the time I am 10 years old, it has become my constant interrupter. When my cat Coco climbs onto the couch with me, she rubs her face against mine so softly, she purrs so gently that I'm tempted to let myself melt into her. But the ache interrupts with, be careful, she won't live very long, you'll have to bury her soon. When my grandmother Alice whispers her evening rosary, I spy on her. She is the master of the universe there in her rocker, controlling everything on earth, keeping me safe. Just as I become lulled into peace by the rocking, the ache points and says, look at how bruised and papery the skin on her hands is. See how they shake? When my mom leans over and kisses me goodnight, I catch the smell of her face lotion. I feel the soft sheets under me and the warm blanket around me, and I breathe in deeply. I rarely make it to exhale in peace, though. The ache paralyzes with me. Paralyzes me with, you know how this ends. When she goes, you will not survive. I don't know if the ache is trying to protect me or terrorize me. I don't know if it loves me or hates me, if it's good or bad. I just know that its role is to constantly remind me of the most essential fact of life, which is, this ends, don't get attached to anything. So when I get too soft, too comforted, too close to love, the ache reminds me. It always arrives in words, she'll die, or an image, a phone call, a funeral, and immediately my body responds. I stiffen, hold my breath, straighten my spine, break eye contact, and lean away. After that, I'm in control again. The ache keeps me prepared, distant, safe. The ache keeps me fine, which is another word for half dead. It takes a lot of effort for a live human being to stay half dead. For me, it also takes a lot of food. When I discovered binging and purging at 10, food addiction becomes a whole life I can lead that has utterly nothing to do with actual life. Bulimia keeps me busy, distant, distracted. I plan my next binge all day, and when I find a private place to start eating, my frenzy becomes a raging waterfall inside and outside me. Loud, much too loud for any interruption at all. There is no remembering, no ache, nothing but the binge. Then I'm just, then just I'm stuffed to the point of near nothingness, the purge. Another waterfall, more noise. Nothing but noise until I'm on the floor, laid out, racked, too tired to feel or think or remember anything at all. Perfect. Bulimia is private. I need a way to silence the ache in public, too. That's what booze is for. Booze overpowers the ache. Instead of just interrupting love, it blocks it completely. No connection is real, so there is nothing risky for the ache to bother interrupting. Over the years, I learned that the bonus of booze is that it destroys all of my relationships before I can. You can't lose people who never even found you. By the time I turn 25, I have been arrested repeatedly. I cough up blood on a regular basis. My family has distanced themselves from me for their own protection. I have no feelings left. I am nowhere near the land of the living, which is for fools and masochists. I am no fool. I have beaten life at its own game. I have learned how to exist without living at all, and I am completely free, with nothing left to lose. I am also almost dead, but by God, I am safe. Take that, life. And then, that May morning, I find myself staring at that positive pregnancy test. I am certainly surprised by the pregnancy, but I am absolutely stunned by my reaction to it. 
I feel inside me a deep desire to grow and birth and raise a person. These thoughts are foreign and baffling. I stand up and stare at my puffy, dirty face in the mirror and think, hold up, wait, what? You, you there in the mirror? You don't even like life. You don't even find it worth trying yourself. Why, then, are you suddenly desperate to bestow life upon another being as though it's some kind of gift? The only answer I have is, because I love it already. I want life for this thing because I love this thing. Why don't I li- Why don't I want life for myself, then? I want to be a being that I love, too. I remember... When I first read this, I immediately wanted to buy a copy for every woman in my family. (laughs) And I was unemployed. Um, I didn't have any money. (laughs) And each copy was like 20-something dollars. And I was hoping I would be able to do it last Christmas. And again, I wasn't able to. And so that's kind of why, I mean, it's the best book, but like, if there's only one book I can get out that I've read, and I've read so many books, this is the book I want to get out first, because it, we all, like, it, it felt like me, it felt like my story that had already been written, and maybe if I could get it into the hands of the people that I loved, they could understand me more or better. And then I kind of expanded on that thought, and maybe if I can get the words into the hands of everyone, then everyone can love themselves just a little bit more. And if everyone loves themselves just a little bit more every single day, and fights for themselves just a little bit more every single day, We'll have a whole world of people loving for themselves and fighting for themselves and fighting to create their perfect world and follow their dreams and their bliss. And maybe people won't hurt as much. Just a small, a small ripple, just a small idea of maybe what would happen if more people had the opportunity to hear these words. Just big ideas. Fast forward 10 years. Wait, did I skip a part? Yeah, I definitely did. Here we go. I was over here. Middle of 84. The ache sweeps in with a ferocity. Danger, danger. Don't be ridiculous. It becomes difficult to breathe. Yet there in that bathroom, dirty, sick, broken, aching, gasping, I still want to become a mother. That is how I learned that there is something deeper and truer and more powerful inside me than the ache, because the deeper thing wins. The deeper thing is my desire to become a mother. This is, the, this is what I want more than I want to stay safe. I want to be this being's mother. I decide right there on the floor to get sober and re-enter the land of the living. I suspect that the courage I muster up to make this, this decision is due, in large part, to the fact that I am still wasted from the night before. I stand up and wobble out of the bathroom and into life. Life is exactly as I remembered it. Just the fucking worst. While I attempt to both become a human and grow a human... At the exact same ridiculous time, I am also teaching third grade. By noon each day, I am dizzy with several sicknesses at once. Morning sickness, withdrawal sickness, and the sickness of living without a daily escape plan. Each day at noon, I walk my class the long way to lunch so I can peek into my friend Josie's classroom and see the sign hung above her window, which says in big black block letters, we can do hard things. We can do hard, which is, by the way, Glennon Doyle's podcast now, which when I get around to it, I will link in the description below. Um, It's a really great podcast. Glennon and Glennon's sister hosts it. And sometimes Abby, Glennon's wife, joins in. Um, Abby has been joining in more recently. 
in the more recent ones as opposed to the earlier ones. It's a good podcast. There's a lot of topics. Um, if you've been enjoying this book, you'll probably also enjoy that. We can do hard things becomes my hourly life mantra. It is my affirmation that living life on life's own absurd terms is hard. It isn't hard because I'm weak or flawed or because I made a wrong turn somewhere. It is hard because life is just hard for humans and I am a human who is finally doing life right. We Can Do Hard Things insists that I can and should stay in the hard because there is some kind of reward for staying. I don't know what the reward is yet, but it feels true that there would be one and I want to find out what it is. I am especially comforted by the we part. I don't know who the we is. I just need to believe that there is a we somewhere, either helping me through my hard things or doing their own hard things while I do mine. This is how I survive early sobriety, which turns out to be one long return of the ache. I say to myself every few minutes, this is hard. We can do hard things. And then I do them. Fast forward 10 years. I have three children, a husband, a house, and a big career as a writer. I am not just a sober, upstanding citizen. I am kind of fancy, honestly. I am, by all accounts, humaning successfully. At a book signing during that time, a reporter approaches my father, points to the long line of people waiting to meet me, and says, you must be so proud of your daughter. My father looks at the reporter and says, honestly, we're just happy she's not in jail. We are all so happy I'm not in jail. One morning, I am in my closet getting dressed when my phone rings. I answer. It's my sister. She is speaking slowly and deliberately because she is between contractions. She says, it's time, sissy. The baby's coming. Can you fly to Virginia now? I say, yes, I can. I will come. I will be there soon. Then I hang up and stare at the large stack of jeans on my shelf. I am unsure of what to do next. During the past decade, I have learned how to do many hard things, but I still don't know how to do easy things, like book a flight. My sister usually does easy things for me. I think and think and decide that this is perhaps a less than ideal time to call her back and ask if she's aware of any good airline deals. I think some more and begin to wonder if anyone else's sister might be available to help me. Then the phone rings again. This time, it's my mom. Her voice is slow and deliberate, too. She says, Honey, you need to come to Ohio right away. It's time to say goodbye to Grandma. I say nothing. She says, Honey, are you there? Are you okay? How are you today, Glennon? I am still in my closet staring at my jeans. That's what I remember thinking first. I have a lot of jeans. Then the ache becomes real and knocks on my door. My grandma Alice is dying. I am being called to fly toward the dying. How are you today, Glennon? I do not say, I'm fine, Mom. I say, I'm not okay, but I am coming. I love you. I hang up, walk to my computer, and Google how to buy plane tickets. I accidentally buy three tickets, but I am still proud of myself. I walk back into my closet and begin to pack. I am both packing and watching myself pack and watching myself. And my watching self is saying, wow, look at you. You are doing it. You look like a grown up. Don't stop. Don't think. Just keep moving. We can do hard things. Surprisingly, now that the ache has transformed from idea to reality, I feel relatively steady. Dealing with the dropped shoe is less paralyzing, apparently than waiting for that shoe to drop. I call my sister and tell her I have to go to Ohio first. She already knows. My mom picks me up at the Cleveland airport and drives me to the retirement home. We are quiet and soft with each other. No one says she's fine. We arrive and walk through the loud lobby, then through the antiseptic smelling hallway into my grandmother's warm, dark Catholic room. I pass her motorized wheelchair and notice the gray duct tape covering the high speed button, which she lost her right to use when her hallway velocity began scaring the other residents. (sighs) 
I lost the word residence. I know it's somewhere. There we go. I sat down in the chair next to my grandmother's bed. I touched the Mary statue on her bedside table. Then the deep blue glass rosemary, rosemary beads draped over Mary's hands. I peek behind the table and see a small calendar hung there. The theme of which is hot priests. Each month priests wears a full vestment and a smoldering smile. This calendar is a fundraiser for something or another. Charity has always been important to my grandmother. My mother stands several feet behind me, giving my grandmother and me time and space. I have never in my life felt the ache more deeply than I do in that moment. As my grandmother stands behind me, watching me touch each of her mother's things, knowing exactly which memory I am recalling with each lingering touch. Knowing that her daughter is preparing to say goodbye to her mother, and that her mother is preparing to say goodbye to her daughter. My grandmother reaches over, rests her hand on mine, and looks at me deeply. This is when the ache becomes too powerful to resist. I am out of practice. I don't stiffen. I don't hold my breath. I don't break eye contact. I unclench and let it take me. First, it takes me to the thought that one day, not long from now, these roles will shift. I will be my mo in my mother's place, watching my daughter say goodbye to my mother. Then, not too long from then, it will be my daughter watching her daughter say goodbye to me. I think these thoughts, I see these visions. I feel them too. They are hard and deep. The ache continues to take me with it. And now I am somewhere else. I am in the ache. I am in the one big ache of love, pain, beauty, tenderness, longing, goodbye. I am here with my grandmother and my mother, and suddenly I understand that I am here with everyone else too. Somehow I am here with everyone who has ever lived and ever loved and ever lost. I have entered the place I thought was death and has turned out to be life itself. I entered this ache alone, but inside it I have found everyone. In surrendering to the ache of loneliness, I have discovered unloneliness. Right here, inside the ache, with everyone who has ever welcomed a child or held the hand of a dying grandmother or said goodbye to a great love. I am here with all of them. Here is the we that I recognized in Josie's sign. Inside the ache is the we. We can do hard things, like be alive and love deep and lose it all because we do these hard things alongside everyone who has ever walked the earth with her arms with her eyes arms and heart wide open the ache is not a flaw the ache is our meeting place it's the clubhouse of the brave all the lovers are there it is where you go alone to meet the world the ache is love the ache was never warning me this ends so leave she was saying this ends, so stay. I stayed. I held my grandmother Alice Flaherty's paper hands. I touched the wedding rings she still wore 26 years after my grandfather's death. I love you, honey, she said. I love you too, Grandma, I said. Take care of that baby for me, she said. That was it. I did not say anything remarkable at all. It turns out that a lot of goodbye is done in the touching of things. Rosaries, hands, memories, love. I kissed my grandmother, felt her warm, soft forehead with my lips. Then I stood up and walked out of the room. My mother followed me. She shut the door behind us and we stood in the hallway and held each other and shook. We had taken a great journey together to the place where brave people go and it had changed us. My mom drove me back to the airport. I boarded another plane to Virginia. My dad picked me up and we drove to the birthing center. I walked into my sister's room and she looked over at me from her bed. Then she looked down at the bundle in her arms and up at me again. She said, sister, meet your niece, Alice Flirty. 
I took baby Alice into my arms, and we sat down in the rocking chair next to my sister's bed. First, I touched Alice Flaherty's hands, purple and papery. Next, I noticed her gray-blue eyes, which stared right into mine. They looked like the eyes of the master of the universe. They said to me, hello, here I am. Life goes on. Since I got sober, I have never been fine again. Not for a single moment. I have been exhausted and terrified and angry. I have been overwhelmed and underwhelmed and debilitating, depressed, and anxious. I have been amazed and awed and delighted and overjoyed to bursting. I have been reminded constantly by the ache. This will pass. Stay close. I have been alive. Oof, okay. No wonder my voice is tired. This is the longest video yet. Well, thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, we're gonna, we got, you know, a little bit left to go. Well, we've got most of it left to go, to be entirely honest. Somehow it's part three. Um, and aside from that, thanks so much for hanging out with me for this first week. Um, and I hope it's been a good one for you. And I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.